Hey guys, it's Daniel. When it comes to iconic grunge artists and video games, to the best of my knowledge, the most intense hardcore video gamer was Lane Staley of Alice in Chains. It's well documented that Lane Staley was a huge fan of video games, especially during the latter part of his life when he essentially lived in seclusion in his apartment in Seattle. Now, although he was not known to have been as big of a gamer as Lane Staley, Kurt Cobain, nonetheless, had an appreciation for video games. As a matter of fact, according to Dave Grohl, Kurt was a very big fan in particular of Mario. I'll be sharing a quote from Dave Grohl where he discusses this later on in this video. Before that, I want to explore a few different things. First, I want to read to you guys a segment from Nirvana's official biography, Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana by Michael Azarad. At one point in this book, Michael Azarad describes what it was like walking into Kurt Cobain's house. Quote, The garage is filled with boxes and boxes of papers, artwork, guitar guts, and years and years of thrift shop purchases. Two boxes are crammed with transparent plastic men, women, and even horses. Close by are an amplifier, a bass guitar, and the one thing in the house that could conceivably be called an indulgence. A Space Invaders type video game that Kurt picked up for a couple of hundred bucks. He records high scores on it with initials like F.U.K. End quote. Now, Space Invaders was released as an arcade game by the Japanese company Taito in 1978. Since the original release, there have been multiple Space Invaders sequels over the years. Though Michael Azarad did not mention exactly which Space Invaders type game Kurt had, according to a source I was looking at online, it likely wasn't the original Space Invaders game from 1978 or similar games like Galaga from 1981. The reason being is that in those games, you couldn't add initials to high scores, which according to Michael Azarad, Kurt liked to do. Therefore, it was likely a game released later on in the 80s or early 90s, but again, no mention is made as to which game it was exactly. What is known is that Kurt Cobain owned either a Nintendo NES or SNES and a Game Boy. Now, if I may jump in for a second. Personally, I owned a few Game Boy Colors growing up and spent countless hours playing with them. The two games I played the most were by far Pokemon Red and Blue both of which were released for the original Game Boy in North America in 1998, well after Kurt died. During Kurt's lifetime, the biggest Game Boy games in North America would have been Tetris, the original Zelda, and several of the original Mario Game Boy games. Given the fact that Dave Grohl has said Kurt Cobain really liked Mario, I'd say there's probably a good chance Kurt would have owned at least one of the Mario Game Boy games. During Kurt Cobain's lifetime, the following Mario-related games were released on the original Game Boy. Super Mario Land, Alleyway, Dr. Mario, Yoshi, Yoshi's Cookie, Super Mario Land 2, and Wario Land Super Mario Land 3. Again, there's a pretty good chance Kurt owned at least one of these games. By the way, interestingly, the original Nintendo Golf game for Game Boy, released in 1989, also features Mario as a character. I'm not sure if Kurt owned that game or if Kurt ever tried golfing in real life. Anyways, aside from Nintendo-related games, Kurt once gave an interview where he spoke about Atari, specifically the game Pong. Now, it's not clear when this interview is from or who Kurt was speaking with. It's an audio-only interview and the audio is not very good quality. It's hard to understand what Kurt is saying. But I tried my best to transcribe what he was saying and I'll be reading that to you now. Quote, Pong. It's the first video game of its kind where there's a little dot that went back and forth on the screen. It was a big game everywhere in America. It was the first home version of a video game, before Atari. I mean, it was an Atari game, actually. You've heard of Atari? Yeah, that's what it was. The first game that came out on Atari was Pong. Frogger was on Atari also. End quote. Now, interestingly, when it comes to Kurt Cobain and video games, there was actually a legal issue involving Courtney Love and Guitar Hero. Guitar Hero, of course, is a big video game franchise, which is published by the American company Activision. The original Guitar Hero game was released on November 8, 2005, and there have been several follow-ups since. The controversy about Kurt Cobain was for Guitar Hero 5, which was released in September of 2009. The following is from the book Nirvana Facts by John D. Lurson. Quote, When an unlocked Kurt Cobain avatar appeared in the Guitar Hero 5 video game in September of 2009, 
allowing for the Nirvana guitarist to perform any song in the Guitar Hero catalog. Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic took aim at Activision, the game's manufacturer. In a statement released on September 10th of 2009, they said the following, We want people to know we are dismayed and very disappointed in the way Kurt is used in the Guitar Hero game. The name and likeness of Kurt Cobain are the sole property of his estate. We have no control whatsoever in that area. Chris and Dave went on to acknowledge that they knew Cobain's image would be used alongside two Nirvana songs in the game, but they were unaware that players could unlock the character to perform other artists' music in the company of Guitar Hero's other cartoon characters. In the statement, they urged Activision to do the right thing in relocking Kurt's character so that this won't continue in the future. Earlier the same day on September 10th, Courtney Love had revealed that she was planning to sue Activision, announcing on Twitter, Wait till you see what my lovely lawyer has cooked up. I never, ever signed off on this. By the way, we get no money for this travesty. Francis gets no money for the rape. Activision responded in its own press release. Guitar Hero secured the necessary licensing rights from the Cobain estate in a written agreement signed by Courtney Love to use Kurt Cobain's likeness as a fully playable character in Guitar Hero 5. Through her lawyers, Courtney Love argued that the contract did not allow for Activision to denigrate Cobain's image. While the details of the legal outcome have never been revealed, it is an equally frightening and amusing sight to watch Kurt rapping Public Enemies Bring the Noise in his Daniel Johnson t-shirt, or perform songs by Bush and Bon Jovi. End quote. Bottom line, after years of negotiations, Kurt Cobain was officially sanctioned as a playable character in Guitar Hero 5. Given how popular of a game Guitar Hero is, especially back in the 2010s and 2000s, who knows, maybe Kurt himself would have given the game a shot and liked it. One grunge icon I'd say probably would have given Guitar Hero a shot at some point if he were alive would have been Lane Staley. As mentioned, Guitar Hero was released originally in November of 05, about three and a half years after Lane's death in April of 02. Lane Staley was an avid video gamer. According to Lane's mother, Nancy McCallum, she once told journalist Greg Prado that Lane was, quote, a video game freak. Lane Staley owned multiple video game consoles and different games. It's been said that his favorite video game in general was Metal Gear Solid. The original Metal Gear Solid was released for PlayStation in 1998. With that said, there were two earlier Metal Gear games. The first, titled Metal Gear, was released only in Japan and Europe in 87. The second, titled Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, was released only in Japan in 1990. Both of those titles were computer games, not video games, in the sense that they weren't console games for something like PlayStation or Xbox, they were based for the computer. Now, the 1998 release of Metal Gear Solid for PlayStation was the first Metal Gear game available in North America. During Lane's lifetime, a second Metal Gear game was also released in North America. That game was Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, which was released for the PlayStation 2 in 2001. Given the fact that Lane Staley is said to have been both a big gamer and specifically a big Metal Gear fan, I'd say it's likely he owned both of the PlayStation-based Metal Gear games which were released in his lifetime. Perhaps he even somehow got a hold of the original Japanese versions of Metal Gear, released in 87 and 1990, though I have a feeling that likely wasn't the case. Now, when it comes to Japanese video games, arguably the most iconic Japanese video game character ever is Mario, which is kind of funny because the character is actually Italian. And interestingly, especially considering Kurt Cobain was a big fan of Mario, the origins of Mario have a Seattle area connection. This is Mario Segale, an Italian-American businessman, the person who the character Mario is based off of. Mario Segale is from Washington State, and in the early 80s, Nintendo was renting out a Mario Segale-owned warehouse. The warehouse was located in Tuquila, a city just south of Seattle. This warehouse was being used by Nintendo in 1981 as their American headquarters. On one fateful occasion that year during the development of Donkey Kong, Mario Segale visited the warehouse to collect overdue rent from Minoru Arakawa, the president of Nintendo America at the time. Mario scolded Minoru in front of his employees. Subsequently, Minoru and the other developers decided to rename the Donkey Kong player character Jumpman to Mario. So, Mario's origins have a direct Seattle area connection, which makes it even more fitting that according to Dave Grohl, Kurt Cobain was a big fan of the Mario franchise. 
The following is from Dave Grohl, where he discusses what it was like moving in with Kurt Cobain in 1990. Dave Grohl officially joined Nirvana in the late summer of 1990 and soon moved from Los Angeles to Olympia, Washington, where Kurt was living. Together, they lived in this house here. I had the opportunity to visit this house before. I'll be showing you footage from that later in this video. But first, here's what Dave had to say. Quote, It was the fall of 1990 in Olympia, Washington, and I had just received my first check as a paid member of Nirvana, a whopping 400 bucks. It was by far the biggest payday of my professional life up until that point. This much-needed advance from our newly hired management company, Gold Mountain, came at a time when Nirvana was being courted by every major label record company known to man in an all-out bidding war. Yet, Kurt and I were literally starving and living in a complete squalor. Our apartment at 114 Northeast Pear Street was the back unit of a dilapidated old house built around 1914, with one bedroom, one bathroom, a small living room, and a kitchen the size of a broom closet. Ironically, located just across the street from the Washington State Lottery Building. Versailles, it was not. Unclean doesn't even begin to describe the carnage within. It made the Chelsea Hotel look like a Four Seasons. Whitney Houston's bathroom turned upside down. A trailer park tornado aftermath of ashtrays and magazines. Most people would never dare to step foot in such a disastrous cave. But it was our humble abode, and we called it home. Kurt occupied the bedroom while I slept in my sleeping bag on an old brown couch littered with cigarette burns, which fell far short of my six-foot frame. At the end of the couch was an old table where Kurt kept a pet turtle in a putrid terrarium. A true lover of animals, Kurt had an intriguing, perhaps metaphorical, appreciation for turtles, as their shells, the thing that most protected them, were actually quite sensitive. Like having your spine on the outside of your body, he once said. But as beautiful and anatomically poetic as that sentiment may have been, it eventually made no difference to me, as this reptile kept me awake every night by tapping its head against the glass for hours on end in an attempt to escape our shared den of filth. I couldn't blame the poor thing. I often felt the same. At the time, I had figured out how to survive off a 3 for 99 cents corn dog special at the gas station across the street. The trick was to eat one for breakfast at noon and save the other two for a later dinner after rehearsal, holding me over until the hunger pangs set in again and I was forced to shamefully wander back into the fluorescent glow of the convenience store lights with another crumpled dollar bill in my hand. Purely sustenance, it was just enough to keep my 21-year-old metabolism wiring, though sadly it lacked any real nutritional benefit. This malnourished diet, coupled with my penchant for playing drums five nights a week with every fiber of my scrawny being, had reduced me to a virtual waif-like marionette, barely filling out the dirty old clothes that I kept in a duffel bag on the floor in the corner of the living room. It was more than enough to drive anyone back to the comforts of their mother's home cooking with their tail between their legs, but I was 2,786 miles from Springfield, Virginia, and I was free. This $400 advance was by far the most money I had ever seen in my life. In my mind, I was now Warren Buffett. Soon, our afternoons in Olympia were spent shooting cartons of eggs from a distance in the backyard of our old house and playing Super Mario World until the sun came up. Our den of filth was now turned into an adolescent recreation center. To me, this was Versailles. Before long, however, my lifestyles of the rich and the famous honeymoon on Pear Street was over, and I returned to rationing corn dogs and cursing the incessant tapping of the turtle terrarium night after night head buried in the dirty cushions of that old couch. Lesson learned. The season turned dark, and homesickness began to set in. I had left my friends, my family, my sweet Virginia behind for this. The cruel Pacific Northwest winter weather and lack of sunlight only deepened the feeling of depression looming in the shadows. But fortunately, I still had one thing keeping me from retreating back home. The music. As dysfunctional as Nirvana could be at times, there was an unspoken focus once we put our instruments on and the amps began to glow. We want it to be great. Or, as Kurt once said to the music executive and titan Donnie Lenner while being courted in his New York City high-rise office, we want to be the biggest band in the world. I thought he was kidding. Hey guys, I was going through some of my footage from my trip to Washington State in 2020, and I came across this cool clip from Kurt Cobain's Olympia House, which I hadn't yet uploaded. If you've been with my channel for a while, you may remember that during my previous trip to Washington State, a year and a half earlier in 2019, I visited Kurt Cobain's Olympia house and the tenants were kind enough to let me inside and film a bit. During this trip in 2020, on my way down to Aberdeen, I stopped by Olympia for a bit and the tenant at Kurt's house welcomed me inside. Though the interior of the house for the most part has stayed the same, 
there are a few noticeable differences since last time. For the sake of comparison, I'm including the footage from my previous trip at the end of this video. A big thank you to the tenant for welcoming me in. I just think the trees weren't so gnarly. You can tell she's like holding them back or whoever. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It's really cool. What's, what's it like living in here? I mean, pretty chill. I found it pretty funny sitting in the at the couch right there. Mm -hmm. Um, because you'll get like the pretty sunset, but then you'll get the Washington Lottery fucking building, <laughs> and like the main thing, it's like that bright like moon. <laughs> <laughs> Kills the vibe a little bit. Beautiful sunset in the back, and then it's like the lottery. I'm, like, and you're not gonna hit it, and even if you do, it might ruin it. Yeah. Okay, the sunset is the lottery, think of it like that. That's it. Hey guys, now I'm gonna show you the footage from my previous trip. If you'd like to see the full video where I visit Kurt Cobain's different houses, the link is available in the description box below. I wanna mention, by the way, that all the locations of these houses are public domain information, which are listed in the official Nirvana biographies, meaning that consent was officially given to make these locations public domain. Tracy and Kurt lived in both units. Originally, they lived in the first smaller one on the left, and then they moved to the bigger one on the right. The homeowner here has graciously allowed me to take some footage of the place, so we get to experience it ourselves. So he lived in this one here, and then he moved there eventually to this suite. And the actual, the entrance is right here on this side. And you just go around this guy. And go in here. 